You are now joining Children of the Wise. That's right. It's the number one podcast in the galaxy for all things Star Wars television. I'm your host, Alex Maxwell, and joining me as always is... Mac Lacey. Alex, I've been looking forward to this. So chapter yeah. five was just absolutely over the top crazy. Uh, we talked about so much already in our breakdown, and I was just pumped to hear what everybody else had to say about it because i knew the voicemail episode this week is going to be wild so we had like an explosion of voicemails this week like the i think it's literally the most we ever got and so um it was so fun like here's the here's something i want you to know if you call in even if you don't make it on the show i listen to them and we both (laughs) we listen and we I was like, oh, that's a really good, that's really good. Um, so keep calling because they have been just incredible. And I think today's discussion is going to be a lot of fun uh, in terms of what we're talking about, what we're breaking down, what the dark saber training means for Din, what um, the Night of a Thousand Tears yeah. are, is, when did that actually happen? Uh, we, there's going to be a lot of fun theories on this one. Some might even say irresponsible speculation, (laughs) which, you know, might be the new moniker for these voicemail hotline episodes. And so, the um, the thesis statement. Yeah. So I'm super excited about it. Like I, I rewatched chapter five this morning. I just, you know, like a Saturday morning cartoon type thing going on for me. And it's just, I love it so much. Uh, There is just so many cool things. And, you know, there's a lot of parallels, too, between Din and Bobo and what they're going through at the same time uh, that I'm excited about talking on this episode. Uh, But before we jump into the voicemail hotlines that we've gotten... A uh, couple of business things. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at COT Watch. We have a lot of fun over there uh, interacting with you guys. And then, of course, you can support us on Patreon.com slash The Mandalorian Watch, where you get a bonus voicemail hotline episode just like this right after this. We just keep recording, and we do yeah. even more, and we have a lot of fun discussions. It gets kind of wild like over this, there. just like this, sometimes a little sillier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a uh, little less polished, maybe, in the sense of, uh, we, for example, one of our voicemail hotline episodes over on the Patreon, we talked about slide whistles and Jawas a lot, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so, More than I ever thought that I would talk about those two things. We also talked about Darth Crate, uh, which is a very interesting topic. And uh, so make sure you if, you, if you can support us, go over there. It's just $2 a month to get access to all the bonus material, and that includes our commentaries over Season 1 and 2 of The Mandalorian. And now that we've reached our goal, we actually have to do a commentary over the first Ewok movie that neither Mac or I have ever seen. Yeah, we're going in completely blind. I'm I'm actually excited. You know, I'm I'm excited to see what the Ewok movies have to offer. I am too. And here's the thing: we are almost halfway to. Actually, we're over halfway to the next Ewok movie. <laughs> we may which, be getting quite the education. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm super excited about that. And then, of course, you know, I, I do want to keep everyone aware of this, like. When the book of Boba Fett's over, Obi Wan Kenobi is next, and we'll still right. be doing those type of things for Obi Wan Kenobi, and then Andor, so on and so forth. So Absolutely. we're gonna have a lot of fun this year over on the Patreon. Yeah, we've um, got our work cut out for us. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, but if you guys can't support us in that way, a great way you can support us is by giving us a five star review on Apple Podcast and Spotify. We're almost to two hundred on Spotify, and I mm. I would love to get to two hundred over on Spotify. So that would be really cool. Now, before we jump into our voicemails, I do want to give a shout out to our Mandalore tier patrons. And it's grown significantly this week. And we want to yes, thank you guys uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, so we want to thank Sean M, Brian S, Myron C, Dave, Tyler B, Amy C, Emily, Annie, Andrew Verdon, General Meow, 
Bill, Simon, Ghost Spider 2018, Libby from Dayton, Julia F., Aaron H., Joanne D., Jansen B., James Parker Price, Todd, Sam Smallwood, Adam S., Larry S., Matt from Michigan, Rick Villanueva, Jesse, James B., Sean D., Bethany W., Allison, William T., Jenna T., Beskar Outlaw, Ellie, Eli B., Yosefar, George H., Haley Hobbs, Rob, Liam L., Alex from Florida, Breadmaker, Kyle, Noah F., Cassandra from Boston, Sam R., Eric, Mason, and Sophia, Willie C., Annie W., Tyler R., and Matthew V. Thank you so much for being Ooh. our Mandalore tier patrons. Yeah, thank you all so much for holding us down. Alex, take a break after that. That was a, <laughs> quite the list. Man, y'all, yeah, y'all are the best. It just means so much that, you know, you would want to be involved with what we're doing over here in that way. So thank, yeah. thank y'all. Yeah. So I think we should jump into our voicemails because they're incredible. Let's do it. Hello. Um, I'm just calling with a few of my thoughts, theories. I would love to hear some of your feedback. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, okay. One of the first things I noticed was right after... Um, the armorer tells Din that he's no longer a Mandalorian. One of the scenes that happens right after that is the, like, baggage claim part. And one of the first things he says is, I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons are part of my religion. So it's kind of like he's defining himself, like, no, I am a Mandalorian. <laughs> um, another thing I was thinking about is I wonder if the quest he's going on for the armorer is going to be related to the mask of Mandalore. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> Um, and I also am wondering if Boba and Dan are kind of going to expand Mandalore or, like, the Mandalorian population together. Maybe they will, like, start a new clan. Uh, maybe they'll collide with Sabine in the Ahsoka show. I don't know. I'm just really excited and interested to see what will happen. And specifically, like, what the dynamic between Din and Boba will be. I just can't wait. Um, I love the show. Bye. Wow. Great call. For wow. sure. Lots to dive in there. Yeah. Um, so first of all, Din probably still considers himself Mandalorian, despite the armor saying you are no longer Mandalorian because yeah. in that moment he says, I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons right. are part of my religion. Yeah. I, th I think that is going to sum up one of the key conflicts or um, you know, just one of the, the key thematic elements for Mandalorian season three. I think that Din's going to kind of have what he's been taught by the armorer in one ear. And then he's going to have kind of what he's learning through his, you know, meeting Bo-Katan, the, the new experiences he's having on the, you know, in the other ear. And it's going to be, you know, how is he going to reconcile these two kind of influences on his life? You know, I think I think we're going to spend a lot of time with that in Mando season three. Yes. And I think the way needs to become like a good compromise between both ways. Yes, it's it's kind of we get into it with the Jedi, too. Right. There's like extremes in either way. Yeah. can can be dangerous you know you can you can go so far in one direction as kind of a overreaction or like overcompensation um and then end up in da dangerous territory again you know we see that kind of with the the jedi council like during the prequels you know um so yeah it's it that that balance it's it's all about balance it is all up for mandalorian season three so they were like giving yeah. us the seeds of like okay we're planting these seeds and you're going to see this played out in season three of the Mandalorian. I can't wait to see where it goes because yeah. um, we speculated at the end of season two, like this is where it should go. And I'm so glad that they're choosing this path because I think it's the most interesting. I think it's the one that has the most conflict uh, and yeah. um, it's going to make Din grow as a character even more than he ha already has. And so I'm excited yeah. to see that. Yeah, it's it's gonna be like that's gonna be the the scenario, the situation in which all the the pieces we have out on the board right now, how to get all those into play, you know, mm -hmm. with each other. So, what do you think about her theory of what's maybe in the living waters in the mines under Mandalore? Yeah, is potentially the mask of Mandalore, which is a legends idea and thought that I really do hope makes its way into canon. 
Yeah, I do too. Um, you can read like the Knights of the Old Republic's comics. Um, mm-hmm. It's featured you know heavily through there. You've got the Tales of the Jedi War. as well. Yeah, I yeah, believe. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's basically the dark saber has sort of stepped in to the mask of Mandalore's traditional role. Yes, you know. Yep. Um, so I'd like it to be something that is is a little bit of a revamp of the idea you know Ooh, i don't want yeah. it to just be like oh yeah whoever has it is mandalore and um so I, what like what would it be i guess it the it mask would have of to... tarvisla yeah yeah that would be and cool. maybe it has like some kind of more mystical force kind of tie because yeah. din has been kind of thrust into that world you know through his interactions with grogu um so i don't i don't think if there was going to be kind of a, a, a more um, force-based connection to it. I think we've come far enough th- in that direction where it fits now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's exciting to think about. And then, of course, I can't help but separate the Mask of Mandalore from Revan's Mask because they're very similar in my mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because Revan's Mask was originally a Mandalorian mask anyway, right? Like right. He took that from battle. Uh, And this is all legends we're talking about. But yeah, you're right that the idea of the Mask of Mandalore has kind of transferred over to the Darksaber, which is a cool thing. Um, But yeah, that would be very interesting if there's like other Mandalorian artifacts and treasures that maybe we're unaware of at this moment that could come into play later. And then the last point of her voicemail uh, about Sabine Wren potentially kind of stepping into the picture and where she kind of fits in. And if you're not familiar, Sabine Wren is a Mandalorian from the animated show Star Wars Rebels, which you should absolutely watch. I think Rebels is probably one of the most important things to watch to really understand everything that's happening in the live action stuff that's going on right now, even more so than Clone Wars, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, Because it's got Thrawn, it's got... Um, Bo-Katan getting the dark saber from Sabine Wren, all that yeah. story is right there. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, yeah, it's it's just especially like Rebels does so much to bring so much lore, like mm-hmm. both with the Force, both you know continuing the 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 dive into Mandalorian history and lore right. and everything. Um, yeah, definitely a good watch. Um, I I would love to see Sabine Wren um, show up. Like, I don't know where she would fit into like the book of Boba Fett. Um, I see I do her. Think Mandalorian season three would make a lot of sense for her. Yes, yeah. Um, especially if Ahsoka is going to be coming back into the picture in any way, because we know that at some point Ahsoka and Sabine are traveling together. Um, the timeline on that is kind of fuzzy from the yeah. ending of Rebels. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It'd be it'd be cool because I think Sabine is like on the that's where Din kind of needs to be. Yeah. Is a that's a good middle ground. Uh and I think Sabine's already there. Um I potentially could see her like in a scenario where everybody's battling for control of like to be Mandalore. I could see a situation where she actually ends up the leader of all of Mandalore at the end of the day. Right. Because she's got the skills and leadership qualities that I think I could see Den being like, okay, you need to do this instead. You know what I'm saying? Y- yes, I do. Like, <laughs> Den, I could see stepping into like the role of Mandalore when it comes to being like a conqueror to like yeah. kind of, um, you know, in, in a militaristic standpoint, kind of. He's not like a people's person. No. He does. He, he has, n- I don't think he has any interest in ruling anyone. He's you know? also comically almost comically like unaware of everything in the galaxy in the sense of like the only information he has is what the armor tells him right Um, right and i kind of love it because it kind of like we know things that din doesn't and so it's like oh din don't do that no 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 (laughs) yeah like dramatic uh, irony yes so um yeah that would be really really cool uh to see so thank you for your voicemail that was that was good good thoughts yeah, for sure. Let's All go right. to the next one. Let's do it. Hey, guys. Justin from Apex, North Carolina here. Um, hey, that was a great episode. You guys killed the recap. I love reliving all those Clone Wars and Rebels moments. 
Uh, I'm sure you guys are getting a ton of calls about this week's episode and Den's little little best car sweater he had knitted for Grogu. But I, I want to ask a couple questions heading into next week's episode and beyond. One, are are you guys getting a little worried about our guy Boba Fett? Because, I mean, a book to me implies a beginning, middle, and end. That's what, you know, you kind of learn about in school. So, and I know Star Wars doesn't like to kill off its characters, but I'm, I'm a little worried, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a thing in TV where they, they, you take somebody, you're kind of conflicted about them, and, and then they make you feel really good or sympathetic about a character in a, in an episode, and then boom, they're gone. So, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't feel a, a ton of evidence about that, but I just, I'm, I'm worried. You know, all these shows, they're just called, you know, The Mandalorian or Loki or, Hawkeye, you know, but this one is called the Book of Boba Fett, so that kind of seems like a, a an act, a choice that they made for a particular reason. Anyway, um, so that was one thing that I wanted to ask, and then two, you guys were talking about water and how the bowl of most Espo would get filled up, and I was thinking, we know the rains don't return to all of Tatooine because Ray returns there to bury the lightsaber, but what if the planet planet originally dried up because of uh, something cyclical, like our ice ages, you know, like they they come and go, you know, over over millennia. So, um, but what if in one of these cycles in the middle of it, moisture farming started and that kept the rains from returning? So, it, it, and then if Boba's influence stops moisture farming in his jurisdiction, what if those rains return there and flooded the bowl? Anyway, uh, it could probably it's probably just a big huge something kind of ship that fills it up. <laughs> but but anyway, I, that's just a thought I had, but. I'm probably getting close to my time, so thanks for all you do, and I wish you guys the best, and thank you for all the coverage. I love it every every week. I look forward to it. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much for your call. Um, great thoughts there. Wow. Okay, so Boba Fett. The, which the title the show, the show is about Boba Fett, right. <laughs> the the book of Boba Fett. Yes. Yeah. Why not just call so, it Boba Fett? Why did they call it the book of Boba Fett? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, to me, the book of Boba Fett really worked when we were still in kind of the first couple episodes when it had this like mythological feel to it, like this this like. Um, you know, it's it felt like the Iliad or something like yeah. that. This like you know, the book of Boba Fett kind of yeah. makes it sound something more um ancient, you know, even though sure. this is actually kinda late in the known timeline of the galaxy. Um, you know, it it it, it was evocative of that to me. So it, it did just fit the the tone and pace of the show to me at first, but I don't think that's really the case anymore. Like I think the story we're focused on now um, you know, the book of Boba Fett is like less of a fitting title. Yeah, I'm not sure really. The only thing I can think of is like the, they knew it was going to have flashbacks. And mm. so it's like, you know, like th these are chapters in his life, right? Like you're seeing all the chapters of Boba Fett's life played out. Now, I will say, I don't know if I'm not getting the feeling he's going to die at the end of this. There's and, not enough time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I just don't feel like he is. Um, I could see him dying later, like, maybe in that big crossover type thing. I could definitely see yeah. him sacrificing himself there. Yeah. I think I think they're going to keep him on the bench to be he, able to pull yeah. in to the later stories, like you're saying, like that, yeah. that crossover event. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's going to happen. I don't see him going out by the end of this one. I don't think so. Um, I would be very shocked for him to, like, because... Because really, essentially, the beginning of the show was him like resurrecting from the dead, right. just to kill him again. <laughs> be um, a really short-lived, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, second uh, life. Really, like, Boba Fett just cannot catch a break. Uh, no. But part of me, uh, we also speculated this at the end of season two of The Mandalorian. Like, I was always wondering, like, is this like a title that they're going to be using for like several Mandalorians if they wanted to do like a season of a show? For them, like, for example, the book me, of Paz Vizla or, or something the, like. Not, not that they would do that, but the book of Bo Katan works as a title. Ooh, you're right. You know, like, and there's been a lot of rumors that she's getting her own show. Interesting. 
so like it's almost like okay we've we saw the book of Boba Fett. Now the next season is the book of Bo Katan, and then maybe you could do the book of Sabine Wren, or you know what I'm saying? Like you could, yeah, you could keep that tradition going if you want to tell a story in the sense of there's going to be a lot of flashbacks because typically Star Wars doesn't do flashbacks. The only time that it's really started was the Last Jedi and uh, right. the Rise of Skywalker, and those and have it always took, like. A force mechanic to right, exactly. be able to mess with that as a storytelling <laughs> device. You know, they they found like an in universe right justification for it, basically. Right. So, like to do it this way, maybe that book of title kind of keeps it th- them able to do it. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I don't think Boba Fett is in danger of dying, and honestly, I don't think that really any major character is gonna die. Uh, which I doesn't mean I don't that think so. Like I don't, I don't think Finnick would. Fin- mm-hmm. it, it, again, it's the same thing. She just got brought back to life too, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any. Well, and maybe like some of the villain or yeah. the antagonist oh, the Pikes, characters. The you know, Pikes like maybe are the biting. Huts. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, not the, the good guys though. I don't think. Yeah, the twins may go out. Mm-hmm. BK maybe, maybe if anybody, but I don't even, I don't even see him. Right. Right. So, so, I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then the waters uh, potentially coming to the bowl on Mos Espa. Um, I like the idea that maybe Tatooine goes through cycles. Um, I still think that's important for the next two episodes we're going to see because I'm assuming we are going to be with Boba Fett and back to the main storyline and stuff. So, yeah. uh, it's something at least just to be on your mind. What's up with the water? What are they going to do with that? Is, is there anything going to be resolved with that and um we'll see because it could go literally anywhere because the show has gone places that we had no idea that it would go right i think i think anything is on the table at this point anything is so that's uh, contrary to us just talking about how we don't think boba's gonna die but (laughs) he could he definitely could um all right so let's do the next voicemail cool cool Hi, Mac and Alex. Um, this is a web from the Patreon. Um, I have some irresponsible speculation, and then I also have some responsible speculation. So I'm going to go with the responsible speculation first. Uh, so in Rebels, when Kanan is teaching Sabine to fight with the Darksaber, he realizes that the Darksaber is not cooperating with her because she's carrying a lot of negative energy about her family. So he kind of pokes at her about that and forces her to confront it, so that she can overcome her demons about it. And then she's able to master the dark saber. So do you think that the armor's quest that she gives Din to redeem himself could be her way of forcing Din to address his demons so that he can then master the dark saber? Um, okay, so now for my irresponsible speculation, which as Jeff would say, is in no way true. Uh, could the armor actually be Sabine herself? Um, so stay with me. <laughs> she makes things. Uh, she makes weapons specifically. Um, she knows a lot about the Jedi. She knows a lot about how the dark saber works. She knows how to fight with it. Um, she knows all about Bo-Katan and she distrusts weapons that can defeat Mandalorian armor, like the Beskar spear and like, um, Sabine Duchess weapon from Rebels. Um, all right, guys, thanks for listening to watch. Wow. Ooh, yeah. Hey, Web, thank you so much for your call. Um, there's a lot to get into here. Yeah. Um, I, I, th- I think we're kind of thinking similarly with like the armor sending Din into the minds of, of Mandalore. I, I always want to say Mines Moria. of Moria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it totally looks like that though, right? Yeah. It's going to look I, like that. I, I think so. Big like yeah, vast. stone Mandalorian mm-hmm. statues mm-hmm. in there, you know, like yeah. I I do think it's going to whatever the armor's end goal is. And I'm at this point thinking it might be galactic conquest. You never know. It, it's they'd have to grow significantly uh, in a short amount of time for that to be feasible, but um I do, I do think she's like grooming Din for something. Like I, yes. she didn't have to even tell him about the mines if she really wasn't interested in him being redeemed or anything like that. 
it, it just seemed very pointed to me. Um, there's something that she knows he needs to do down there in order to be who ne- who either he needs to be or maybe in a worst case scenario who the armorer wants him to be. I just had a vision All right, of the future. Lay it on me. Okay. I t- as you were talking, I just had a vision of Din with Grogu and Grogu has his mithril armor on. Right, and they're they're walking in the minds of Moria slash Mandalore, which it's just the same thing in my it's mind right now. Like, <laughs> okay, and they're just walking, copy-paste. yeah, and they're walking in these vast tombs. It's like a tomb down there, yeah, and something huge and significant. There's a light that Grogu is looking at as he wears his armor, and it's dangerous. I don't know what's happening down there. But man, I love that thought. I know Ooh. what's down there. What's down there? A mythosaur. Oh my gosh! It's kind of right. like the dragon in The Hobbit, like smog. Right. right. So, <laughs> g- go with me here. Like, okay. The mythosaur has been brought up. So, um, oh. it's been a very Let's pointed go. thing in this show. You know. Oh. Um, we're getting so from... irresponsible right now. <laughs> Let's from... go. Quill's episode talking about Din's ancestors and everything. You're Mandalorian. Your ancestors used to grow. You know, the armorer did use like rising, like the great mythosaur kind of as like part of prophecy, right? Yes. Maybe it's more literal than most Star Wars prophecies. And they're really going to like find this mythosaur. Din's going to tame it and they're going to ride it into whatever Ooh, conflict. Heavy lies ahead whether that be the 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 big crossover where everybody teams up against thrawn whether it's you know after that and it's when the children of the watch launch their conquest who knows who maybe there's something down there thrawn wants maybe there's something down there thrawn wants and that's why gideon was there to begin with Ooh. Oh, maybe he wants to, uh, maybe, maybe Thrawn's thinking, what if we had Beskar, like, Chiss, you know, the, uh, TIE Defenders? Mm-hmm. That was, like, his big thing? Yep. Oh, gosh. Beskar TIE Defenders? That'd be, that'd be gnarly. I think they would be way too heavy to fly, but I don't <laughs> know Star Wars physics, so... But I mean, once you, but if they're in space, there is, I mean, does it matter? Things still sink in space in Star Wars, too. That's true. So that is true. <laughs> like I said, I do not know the rules. That is true. Sound works in space. You know, we're, we're playing, we're playing with some different physics. Oh, man. That um, is fun to think about. Uh, wow. Okay. So now let's talk about the armor and who she could potentially be. She was saying maybe she is Sabine. Sabine. I yeah, got another I... person on my mind, though. Ooh. Let's talk about Sabine first, but I got another person who she could be. So if it were to have been Sabine, it would have had to have been like a negative reaction to her experiences during the Galactic Civil War, right? Yeah. Um, it was Because you don't become the armorer willy-nilly one day because you like feel like you're like, you know what, I'm going to get into smithing. And then that <laughs> happens, right? I'm going to become a cult it's... leader. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, th- that's not... Th- th- something bad has to happen, or it has to be yeah. a reaction to something, you know? Yeah. So I guess it'd be just like... It, it, I love that she um, you know, brought up... That would be the consistent creating. with yeah. um, the Beskar spear thing, not wanting to have this like weapon specifically yes. ag- against Mandalorians because of you know what happened to her kind of with the, with the Duchess thing. Yeah, so the Duchess, if you're not familiar, this is kind of spoiler for Star Wars Rebels, but Sabine Wren, basically, because the Empire took over Mandalore after the events of the Clone Wars, Sabine Wren was a part of the Imperial program, I guess, for Mandalorian cadets, and she ended up constructing and creating a weapon that actually worked against Mandalorians. It basically fried Beskar, and like it turned Beskar as a weapon against right. Mandalorians. It basically... It like latched onto Beskar as a superconductor. Yeah, and fried um, you so on the inside. A, yeah, yeah, basically Thanos dusted you. Yes, um, um, and that's it, it was gnarly. Like those are some horrible, heart wrenching episodes <laughs> of Rebels. 
Yeah, and uh, so Sabine made that. And then, of course, she ran away from that and ended up joining the Rebels crew and finding her family with the Rebels crew. But she does have to confront that in the episodes that she sees. So uh, part of me is like, okay, I really hope that the armor would not be Sabine because she made so much gains and strides in terms of overcoming her, her past in, in that. So, But maybe the, the Beskar Spear was something that she created when you know she was also making the Duchess or something like that, uh, but I do get the sense that the armor found the the spear offensive, like she probably yeah. would the Duchess. Like that's a very offensive weapon to Mandalorians. Here's my guess: the the armorer, I think, is someone who mostly believes everything she says. I'm not sh- I'm not convinced she believes everything she says. Or that she doesn't just use some of that to other, you know, some of her other advantages. I I think it is important, and this is a discussion we had on Twitter a lot, at C.O.T. Watch, by the way, uh, with uh, Duchess of Darksaber on Twitter. She's a great follow. She's really good about Mandalorian lore and history and stuff. Um, And we kind of were talking about this a little bit, but um, the, the armor... It, it should be said the armor is an unreliable narrator. Like we can't completely mm-hmm. trust everything the way she presented it um, yeah. because she does have a bias against, you know, people of Mandalore who take off their helmets and don't live the way that she does. And so she's right. going to see it in a different light than everybody else. Like you said on the breakdown, it's from a certain point of view. <laughs> um, what if if we're talking about who the armor could be, if she's already an established character, she's Rook cast. Yep. Which um, from season seven of clone wars is where yeah. she first show, shows up chronologically. Right. Yes. Uh, she's also in the son of Dathomir comics, which are canon. Right. Um, she basically was a mall DeLorean. She's one of Maul's top lieutenants. In when Maul has taken over Mandalore during the Clone Wars, and uh, she is maybe a likely candidate for the armor. I'm still not convinced, though, that she's her. Um, it just seems like, to me, the armor really does kind of believe some of the things she's saying, and it doesn't seem like that's consistent with Rook Cast. Right. The armor has conviction. Yes. Period. Like, whether or not everything she says is something she believes in is, is like, like I really do think the minds of Mandalore thing. I think that's probably stretching the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the creality of the the situation. But, um, yeah, she has, she has conviction. Um, I'd like, I'd like her, I think ultimately to be a new character that we get to learn about their story. Um, you know, maybe something really bad happened during, Mm -hmm. Um, like maybe for instance, when new Mandalore kind of, you know, took, took over when Mandalore went pacifistic, what if then something really ha- like bandits attacked her family and, yes. and, and they weren't able to defend themselves from that. And, you know, yes. something like that would motivate her wanting to revive the old way being like, no, 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 we're, we're yes. vulnerable this way. We need to be stronger. And, um, Yes, that's that's more of what I would like to see. Yeah, and it and it's still, I mean, again, like, like we talked about on the breakdown, it's still fuzzy whether who came first was it Death Watch or was it the Children of the Watch. It could right. go either way, um, yep. <clears throat> and we we don't know yet, but we know that both groups were on Concordia and they were be- basically exiled. Um, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. don't know uh, because. I, the last point about Rook Cast, I just don't, I don't know. Like she seemed pretty tight with Gar Saxon, and we saw what right. happened with Gar Saxon. He became one of the Imperial Mandalorians. Now maybe they had a split, and she was like, "No, we're not doing yeah. that. We still got to stay Mandalorian." But we'll see. Um, like you said, I would rather, I think, have the armor be her own character. Um, yeah, and we never get her backstory necessarily. I just kind of like that vagueness, and that's kind of yeah. fun. Like maybe she tells somebody of her past at some point, but like I don't, I don't need to see her. Yeah, I, 
she needs to remain a mythic character. She's yeah. she's that like Merlin type. She's the yes. the the mythical magical mentor. That's <laughs> She's, no, but she's if, the Triple M character. Honestly, though, if we have to get a backstory and we don't get it in a show or something, Adam Christopher, I'd love for you to write that novel. Book. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sure. that'd be really, really cool. Uh, great call, Awebs, because, I mean, man, that's yeah. a lot of speculation. Some of it irresponsible. Some of it not. Uh, yeah. That's what we love. Thank you. Let's cool, do cool. the next one. Hey, guys. It's Mandalorian Mark. Uh, that new episode was great. There's a lot to talk about, so I'll go right into it. So, spoilers. Uh, I don't trust Yammer as far as I can throw her. Uh, and there's many reasons why. One, we already caught her lying to Din about what it means to be a Mandalorian and you can't take your helmet off and everything like that. But her and Moff Gideon's story about Night of a Thousand Tears, it, they don't gel. They're, you know, something's a little off there. I don't trust a single word she said about that. Um, I mean, I think she has her own agenda to push. Uh, she likes her culture, uh, the ancient way of Mandalore. Supposedly, they're on Concordia during, you know, during the events of Nine Thousand Thousand Tears. So, obviously, she's not going to like Bo-Katan. And that whole speech that she gave about Clan Kreese and Bo and everything like that was 125% biased. And it's pretty evident why, because Bo-Katan has, uh, you know, the true Mandalorian culture as opposed to the ancient Children of the Watch culture that, uh, you know, she follows. Um what else? Uh, and I think it's Din's mission there was very misleading. I think he was there to recruit the armor in Paz Vizsla and anyone else. Um, one, he has a dark saber. Two, I think he was testing the waters to see if she would play ball with Bo. And it was pretty obvious, uh, evident by her speech that it uh, that she wasn't. And the selling point for me was twofold. One, when Din was leaving after the Paz Vizsla fight, he looked over his shoulder. Very, very weird, considering in the first season when you watch in the, in, into the uh, covert, this guy's with weapons and other Mandalorians with weapons. He doesn't even think twice. Even after he fought Paz in season one, nothing. He believed her and Paz and the covert, nothing. When he was leaving that fight, he looked over his shoulder because he knew something was up. He had the dark saber. He's, he listened to Bo-Katan. He knew something was up. He knew that she was lying. Second, after she tells him he's not a long, no longer Mandalorian, what is the first thing he says to a droid? I am a Mandalorian. He knows that her agenda is off. So that's why I think she's full of it, and he knows it too. I think he's on a mission right now to recruit as many people as he can for the reclaiming of Mandalore. The, and the whole you know siege of Mandalore and everything like that, it's not, it's not gelling. Three different stories about one event, and it's just not – feeling right and we know in star wars is pov flashbacks that aren't necessarily true the last jedi and luke and ben's confrontation in the past is an example of that uh i there's so much more i can't get into about this but i think that mandalore isn't completely wiped off and we'll see how it goes thank you may the force be with you and for mandalore keep the watch <laughs> mandalorian wow. mark brought it wow. man okay Lot to get into there. Um, okay, yeah. So he obviously is like not giving the armor the benefit of the doubt in terms of yeah her her motives are nefarious, and I think they're yeah. it, like even if we are to give the benefit of doubt to the armor, I still feel like what you feel, Mac. There's something that she wants to do that doesn't something's off. Yeah, like I'm not. I'm not saying she's going to betray what she believes or what she's teaching or anything like that, but her aims are going to be a net negative for the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. I think. D yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Like it might not be that she's like a villain evil kind of character, but like she, I think she will be an antagonistic force. I yeah. like, I think I liked that Mark called what Bo-Katan led and what what they practice the true mandalorian yes. culture because it is yes that that is the collective sum of what's happened to mandalore they're yes like they've come back around kind of on some things you know recently like obviously bo katan likes weapons and right. fighting she's not like her sister satine necessarily right but she but still has also, those principles 
Yeah, they've learned yeah. and grown as a culture, right. you know? Right. And so, like, I do think no matter what, the the children of the watch, that belief, the way, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, that's going to come into conflict with true Mandalorian culture. Yes. Um, so so I think I think we can safely say that like the armorer is gonna be poised as an antagonistic force. Yeah, and I could see it too, like someone like Gideon or Thrawn manipulating a situation to where it's like no, I want Mandalorians divided and fighting each other because if right. if the armor and Bo Katan were to unite, yes, whoever the they're against is in trouble. <laughs> right, Mandalore <laughs> gets to do whatever they want at that yeah. point. Yeah, um, yeah. So, okay, let's talk about real quick the timeline on the Night of a Thousand Tears and what the Siege of Mandalore is because the, Mark pointed out like Moff, the way Moff Gideon described it in season one of The Mandalorian and the way that the armor described it in this latest chapter, there doesn't seem to be like a meshing point. And I'm not so sure that it's off necessarily. It's just like our understanding of it was off, if that makes sense. He yeah, I think I think it's just that like we automatically assumed that the Night of a Thousand Tears was was part of the Siege of Mandalore we already knew about and had a timeline for. So okay, this you this just, is you just got a very uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> well scheming back there. We got to start then with the Siege of Mandalore. When was that? Was that what we saw in the Clone Wars? Because there's a, season seven of the Clone Wars is called, uh, one of the episodes is called the Siege of Mandalore, right? Right. Is that the same event that Moff Gideon is talking about? So there's three really options here. Right. One is that's just the title of the episode for us. Right. Um, because if you watch it, and again, this is something that Duchess of Darksaber on Twitter talked about a lot. Uh, she's she's amazing. Um, if you watch it, it's not really a siege necessarily as it's much not. as an attack. Um, yeah. Now, I, I was talking about how you could consider that a siege if the Republic came and then they never left and became the Empire. It's like they're sieging Mandalore, and it never ended until what we saw in Star Wars Rebels, where Sabine Wren gives the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, and yeah. that's the beginning of the end of the Siege of Mandalore. Like You could consider from that episode of the Clone Wars all the way to Rebels a long siege of Imperial Empire. Occupation. I couldn't say the yeah. word. Um, so it, it could be that's a siege, or they consider something after when Bo-Katan got the Darksaber, the Empire came back in a huge way and sieged Mandalore, and that's when the Night of a Thousand Tears happened. There could be multiple yeah. sieges, I guess. Right. I'm, I'm leaning towards that last option. Um, I do think at this point, the the at least a siege of Mandalore would have happened with between specifically the Empire and Bo Katan's Mandalore. Yes. I think from what the armorer says about her, you know, her fall, I, I guess, like or, or defeat, or you know, that backs that up. You know, in, in the timeline on that, that puts it then. If that's the case, the siege of Mandalore then actually happened about one year before New Hope to the range of Return of the Jedi. Like, it happened somewhere in that time period. I'm guessing not long before New Hope because I think that's why you don't really see Mandalorians that much in the Galactic Civil Wars because they were mostly all destroyed. Yeah, I, I think that's got to be the case. Um, it also would make sense for it because, like, as soon as a New Hope happens the empire that's that's actually the beginning of the empire's decline like right. the the galactic civil war took so much of their their attention and and efforts and everything they were weaker than like like i think the height of the empire's power is leading up to a new hope and at, you know that's obviously going to be the point when this happened you also see like a lot of those k2 droids being used which we see that in like rogue one and stuff like that don't see them too much afterwards, you know? Right. 
Um, so maybe that kind of also helps place that on the t- the timeline. Yeah. So probably before A New Hope, but probably after the event. Well, it would have to be after the events of what we saw in Star Wars Rebels. So it's, yeah. it's somewhere in that time period right there. Um, yeah. The stuff went really bad for Bo-Katan, and we need yeah. her side of the story. Like Mark said, yes. we, we saw in The Last Jedi what it looks like from different perspectives. We saw Ben's perspective of things, which was very different than Luke's. Right. And then there was actually the true story. There was Luke's version, there was Ben's version, and then there and was the somewhere actual version. In the, med- the middle was the truth, yeah. yeah. It is interesting that like the first time we bring in flashback storytelling, it's it's unreliable. Like f- from the get go, you get like <laughs> I I love that though that are... <laughs> because yeah. it's like that's how it really is. Like right, of course there always is like a little touch of whoever's telling a story on it. Yeah. Um, and so like I I kind of love that. And then um, one last thing that I'm thinking about right now in season one of The Mandalorian at the end when Moff Gideon is talking about all of this. He says that he knows Din Jaren's name because he got it from the registers of Mandalore during the siege. So, like, part yeah. of me wonders how, if he's been a part of the Children of the Watch, how did, were they, did they have to be registered with Mandalore? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of leeway there because Concordia is in the Mandalore system. Um, so like, it might be that even the folks hanging out on Concordia, kind of the exiles, which like children of the watch is probably going to be in that, that group, you know, they're still technically governed by the Mandalorian government and would have to be registered that way, you know? Yeah. Um, like, like as, as citizens of the system, maybe. So there's, there's some leeway there, but there's, there's some other options too, that are a little more, uh, uh complex it's interesting because like the way gideon described the event he made it seem like din witnessed it right so it's just interesting to kind of think through those possibilities because we don't know for sure but like i think we have a better understanding of things well uh oh max got some speculation i I don't know if there's i don't know but what if the children of the watch allied with the empire during the night of a thousand tears then that would give more credence to the armor being rook cast yeah and and maybe like there's just a shared trauma and like under like all of these characters in the children of the watch that we're seeing are carrying this guilt of knowing that like they did the wrong thing or or in the armorer's case probably not you know Mm. um so it could be that we get into like maybe and then they were Din betrayed and they you know like, afterwards yeah yeah like maybe Din t- took part in the in the Night of a Thousand Tears oh, you know no. Like, no not our boy Din I, I'm I'm just this is this is irresponsible speculation <laughs> uh, man that would be devastating I I don't know I I, I get the sense these stories have been told to Din. And he just believes the stories because the armor told him so. And yeah. I think he knows the stories. And so when Gideon said it, it's like, okay, he, it sparked his memory of what the stories he had been told were. Because we know, actually, know he's never been on Mandalore. Because when he talked to Bo Katan at right. the end of season two, he said, um, he basically admitted to the fact he's never been back to Mandalore because Boba <laughs> Fett had to tell him. That place is glass. There's nothing left yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, whew, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yep. We'll see. But anyway, great call. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, let's do uh, one more, and then yeah, this one's gonna be fun. Hello, my name is Janice Porter. I'm 12 years old. I live in Tacoma, Washington. I really love what you guys have been doing with the show and stuff. I I just love it. I think, here's my theory, I think that we'll see Boba probably ride, learning to ride how to, you know, learning how to ride the Rancor, and I think either in this season, in this 
show Boba Fett, or more likely in Mandalorian Season 3, we might find a Mesosaur that Mando might, you know, try and ride or something. Because I have seen a fan art of him on a Mesosaur. So I thought that was really pretty interesting. I love this episode. I do also have the Lego set that you guys were talking about, and I'm trying to rebuild it. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited for that. And, uh, yeah, I love what you guys are doing. Hope you play this on the show. Bye. Yeah, dude. That was Thanks awesome. Thanks so much for your call. Thanks so much for your call. Um, Yeah, okay. So I would love to see a big, like, Mythosaur, Raincore, Kaiju battle in Star <laughs> Wars with, like, some AT-ATs and stuff. Oh man! Oh, like taking you know down the technology and stuff. Right. Uh, like, like it's the kind rain of a, court... a, it's a reverse of the trope because like the kaiju monsters would be the good guys, yeah. and then the mechanical robots would be the bad guys. I would love that because then the mythosaur could take on the ATATs, and the rancor could take on the chicken walkers. The ATSTs. Yeah, yeah that would go. be kind of a Kong and Godzilla situation. Yeah. Here's what this call made me think, though. So. This this prophecy that the armor is talking about was in the show, The Book of Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. You could apply. Prophecy can be loosely interpreted sometimes. Indeed. Especially in Star Wars. <laughs> and this would give a whole nother set of wild implications. But like, what if someone sees... Boba on the Rancor, and it's like they equate that to the Mythosaur rising, you know, like Mandalore yeah. on a Mythosaur. It's Boba on a Rancor. It's like that represents what the armor was talking about. Then that's that would give a whole new. Uh, oh, oh man, we've got another player potentially in Boba Fett, like for the title of the throne. Interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ooh. And because, maybe, yeah. like, okay, what if Din, now that he's in exile, he kind of finds his home being separated from the culture he grew up in, um, and what if the armor kind of fills the gap with Boba? Because, um, like, it makes sense that Boba would probably fit in more with the Children of the Watch given that, like, all he knows of Mandalorian culture came from Jaster Muriel, basically. He would just have to, like, the only rule they would be like, Boba, you got to keep your helmet on. You love taking that thing off. <laughs> yeah, he does yeah. take his helmet off too much, huh? But, like, but that's the thing about prophecy. Like, the armor interprets it one way, right? But it could still, like, it could be the Bo-Katan way of, like, it's okay to take off your helmet, Nope. Right. You know, like you, that's just a silly rule that you have that doesn't actually matter and make you Mandalorian at all. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting to think about like that prophecy was given in the book of Boba Fett. And we know we're probably going to see Boba Fett ride a, a monster like Mandalore once rode the Mythosaur. Yeah. It's just interesting. Like, huh, hmm, maybe someone hmm. could interpret that as as the prophecy being fulfilled. So then what, like, would that trigger another sequence of events, maybe? I don't know. Put put some kind of scheme of the armorers in motion or something maybe. like that? Maybe. We'll see. Interesting to think about. Interesting it is interesting to think to about. Think about. Um, all right, I've got an assignment for you, though. All right. For Not me? you, or the for, collar. Okay, okay. great. Whew. Hate homework. I would love for him to build with Legos the mines of Mandalore. That would Ooh. be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. That would be and cool. And then, yeah, send us a picture of it. Yeah. At COT, watch on Twitter or Instagram. Um, okay, so this has been fun, and we get to continue this fun over on the Patreon. Um, this has been, like... This has been a little bit longer, but this has been like really good discussion. And by the way, I re-listened to our Mandalorian History 101 episode, and it still holds up. Like the speculation mm. that we had about everything 
still holds up in the sense of if you're confused about the events and timeline of everything that's going on with the Mandalorians, go back and listen to that episode. Yeah, for sure. Cool, cool. Well, um, yeah, keep those calls coming in. Um, find the number down in the description and everything like that. Um, but we will talk to you again next week when we do our Chapter 6 breakdown. Um, but until then, keep the watch.